Good evening and welcome to Neshoba Regional High School. Thank you. I hope, my name is Lisa Gilbicki. I'm the nurse coordinator for the district. I hope you had a chance to observe hidden in plain sight for the adults um, and parents, guardians that are here this evening. Um, also to explore or speak with representatives from Learn to Cope. Um, explored some of the pieces of art that were created by individuals in recovery and from those that have lost someone to addiction. In addition, our high school EMT cadet students demonstrated hands-only CPR. Please visit them on your way out if you have not done so already. I will share with you that to this evening, um, Stowe TV will be filming here, as well as there'll be a documentary filming of Dr. Ruth Pote. Um, so um, there will be somebody going around with a film camera as well. If you do not wish to be on that film after, please visit with us and we'll make sure that we take you off from that. The Neshoba Regional School District's Substance Abuse Task Force, consisting of dedicated faculty members, was formed after the tra tragic overdose deaths of multiple Neshoba students that deeply affected our community. Our mission is to educate our students, faculty, and community on the dangers of substance use and abuse. To help us navigate this challenging reality, we are pleased to present our guest speaker, Dr. Ruth Poti. She's a board certified family physician and addiction medicine physician at Valley Medical Group in Greenfield, Mass. She is a native of Western Massachusetts and attended public schools in the North Quabbin region. She attended Wesley College, Yale University School of Medicine and did her residency at Boston University where she remained as an assistant professor of family medicine for eight years. In addition to practicing full scope family medicine, she is currently the medical director for the Franklin County House of Correction, the Franklin Recovery and Treatment Center and the Pioneer Valley Regional School District, as well as the chair of the healthcare solutions for the opioid task force of Franklin County. She was named the Franklin County Doctor of the Year by the Massachusetts Medical Society in 2015. Dr. Poti is dedicated to engaging communities such as ours in discussions around substance abuse. Please share with me a warm welcome from Dr. Ruth Poti. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Kind of, can you hear me in back? Is my mic on? Awesome. Um, I am so glad to be here with you all, and I am amazed at how many students are in this auditorium. I'm totally impressed with you people. Um, thank you for being here. I, I actually don't think I've ever, I've been to a nighttime event with this many students, so that is um, kudos to the teachers, to the staff, and to the parents for encouraging your kids to come out. This is a totally appropriate talk for your kids. It's totally appropriate for the adults in the room, too. I'm going to cover a wide range of issues. I'm going to be very big picture about addiction and what it does to the brain. There's nothing I'm going to say that the kids, any kid age in this room, is going to be inappropriate. But we're going to talk about some hard subjects because addiction is a really hard disease. And for those of us in this room that have been in, touched by addiction, we all know that. Um, so. This slide deck is available to anybody who wants it in the room, and your great AD Rich has a copy. If you want it, you just talk to her. Maybe she'll have a sign up at the front desk. You could go give this talk yourself next week, as far as I'm concerned. Take the slide deck and use it. Use it in a classroom, use it in the Sunday school. I don't care where you use it. You might want to practice ahead of time a little bit. We're going to spend our time talking about the extraordinary organ in the body known as your human brain ensconced in your skull. And this human brain of yours is the organ that is changing the most during your lifetime. When you are born, your kidneys are doing what they're supposed to be doing on hour one of life. And your kidneys continue to do that basically until the day you die. They don't really change, right? They grow a little bit, but they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But your brain is changing throughout your entire lifespan. We're gonna focus on the ages between 12 and 24 and what changes happen in the brain. So this part of the brain was the cover of National Geographic in 2017. Who, who grew up with National Geographic? Right, so these are the adults in the room whose hands are up, right? Um, most of our kids don't really even know National Geographic, but for those of us born a little, little longer ago, we grew up with National Geographic and we never recycled it, right? There were stacks of it in our basement. So the cover of National Geographic in September of 2017 was entitled The Physiology of Addiction, because addiction is such a common disorder and understanding how it 
addiction breaks the brain is really critical for all of us. I'm gonna make the story fairly simple. The part of the brain that breaks with addiction is the part of the brain that tells you to live or die every day. It's the most elemental, ancient part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that tells you to find food, find water, and to find a mate to send your genetic material forward. Because the entire purpose of us on this planet is to actually survive long enough to create a few generations ahead of us and to keep them alive. That is who we are as basic creatures. So this part of the brain exists for the cricket, for the koala, and for the human being. And this part of the brain is known as the reward circuit, and it's the part that is impacted with addiction. And if you could pick up the disease of addiction and you were able to move it to the auditory cortex and all you lost was your high pitch hearing when you got addicted to something, it would be a very easy disease to treat. I would get you a hearing aid, I would say you couldn't fly a plane, problem solved. But instead, the part of the brain that tells you to live or die every day is the part of the brain that breaks when you get addicted to something. And it's why it's so important to prevent addiction. It is such a hard to disease to treat on the other side. If we spent more time and money and energy preventing addiction, we will have saved, quite honestly, a generation or two ahead of us. So this part of the brain has a chemical racing through it called dopamine. What does dopamine make you feel like? Yeah, happy, super happy, euphoric, joyful. Holy smokes, that was awesome, do it again. That's what dopamine says to the brain. Dopamine has with it two behaviors that are associated. One is called compulsion, I have to do this thing. The other one is perseveration, I am unable to stop thinking about it. Those behaviors of being compulsive and perseverating is the reason you all exist in this room, is your ancestors, your great, 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 greats were both compulsive and perseverating when it came to finding food and finding water, finding enough calories to keep their family alive, because it was unbelievably hard to survive 200 years ago. 2,000 years ago. It's easy to survive here in the United States now, right? We have calories, too many calories all the time, all around us. But 200 years ago, living in this part of the state was extremely challenging. And those behaviors of being compulsive and perseverating were very helpful. They are not helpful behaviors when it comes to addiction, but they define addiction. So who in this room is in the medical field? I have somebody here who's in medical field people, nurses, therapists, doctors, right? You guys interact with people who struggle with addiction. I know you do because we all do. And one of the things I'll say as a healthcare provider is it can be really frustrating to work with people with addiction. You get mad sometimes because you think to yourself, dude, I just saw you. I told you a week ago to stop drinking. It's killing you. And here you are again in my emergency room struggling with alcohol, right? But I always remind myself about these behaviors of compulsion and perseveration. It is what defines the disease of addiction. So I make an argument that we all have a certain amount of dopamine in our brains. And on average in this room, all of us have about 100 units of dopamine. Now there's no way to measure this. You're not gonna call your family doctor tomorrow and get a serum dopamine level that doesn't exist yet. But there's some of us who are happy-go-lucky golden retriever people. And our baseline dopamine is just high. We're like at 105. I think that's you. I'm just looking at you and I think you're a golden retriever. So a baseline dopamine of 105 is just lucky and awesome and good for you. There's some of us whose baseline dopamine is a little low. Maybe it's 85 or 90. And we work really hard to make ourselves feel good during the day. What are things that build dopamine in your brain that make you feel good? Exercise is a huge dopamine builder, right? I walked into the school, there were athletes everywhere. There are a bunch of you who look to me like spring athletes. What are other things that build dopamine? Food, somebody said eating. Food is a dopamine spiker. Now, sometimes it's not a healthy dopamine spiker, right? A quinoa salad is less likely to give you a dopamine spike than a chocolate bar does. But um, yes, finding food gives you a dopamine spike. So there's things we do to make ourselves feel better. We connect to friends, we listen to music, we dance, we exercise. That naturally brings up our dopamine. So as human beings, we have some normal range of dopamine in our brain, 85 to 105. On average, we're all going to sit at about 100 in this room. The problem is that if we're all sitting at 100 and you find that perfect food that's going to keep your family alive for another week, you're going to get a spike in dopamine. It's going to go to 150, and then it's going to return to normal. You have sex, it's consensual, it goes to 200, and then it goes back to normal. These are behaviors consistent with survival. This is a normal brain that is responding to things in a positive way. When you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine goes to 350. When you use a drug like a strong prescription opiate or heroin, your dopamine goes between 500 and 900. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will go to 1300. 
So those are huge, huge spikes in dopamine, right? Let's talk about what it looks like to the brain. Your brain is an equation with dopamine. It has to do with how much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors are receiving information on the other side, and how many little vacuums are sucking dopamine out. The way cocaine works, it's a very simple mechanism of action. All it does is turn off the vacuum. And when the vacuum is turned off, the dopamine in the active part of the brain can get to the level of 350 because the vacuum isn't working anymore. The way that all the opiates work is different. All the opiates go through a negative feedback loop through the mu opiate receptor, but they shovel more dopamine out into the active part of the brain. I can do this. I can talk about where in the equation dopamine is impacted with every addictive behavior or drug because it is where it ends up. Now, some of the pathways are really complicated. Marijuana is an addictive substance. We could talk about it with that. We could talk about it with nicotine. We could talk about it with alcohol. We could talk about it with gaming and, and gambling, a variety of things. They all end up affecting the dopamine system in the brain. And the problem is that for the 200,000 years we have been in this human form on this planet, your brain has been used to a dopamine level of 100, 150, or at a peak, 200. And when your brain starts seeing dopamine levels of 350, 900, 1300, your brain says, oh my gosh, something is wrong. The volume is too loud. I need to turn it down. I need to down-regulate. Your brain's response to developing a dependence or an addiction to something is it stops making dopamine. It erases 80% of the dopamine receptors and it turns on every vacuum in sight. So when you're struggling with an addiction, you wake up in the morning and your new dopamine level isn't 100 or even a bad 85. You wake up in the morning and you have a dopamine level of 40. You are a miserable human being who can barely get out of bed, pour a bowl of cereal for their kids or go to work. And what your brain is doing, it's screaming at you. You know how to fix this. You can make this better. If you just continue to drink, if you just continue to use, you will feel normal again. People who struggle with addiction are chasing feeling normal every day of their lives. And that's why they continue to use, right? We may get mad at our people who struggle with addiction. We may say, just get over yourself, just stop, right? It isn't that easy. What makes more sense to me is that when this reward circuit of the brain is screaming at you, feel better, get better, get your dopamine up, it makes sense to me that you would continue to use because this part of your brain has broken in such a specific way. And again, if what we can do in this room tonight is we can prevent a substance use disorder for some segment of our young population, then quite honestly, slightly miraculous thing will have happened because this is a preventable disease, truly a preventable disease. It leads to this concept of a broken brain. But I wanna talk to you about what happens in a local emergency room. And, and don't, don't be upset with me, but I'm gonna go after the little ER that's in Clinton, UMass's ER in Clinton, because this happens in every emergency room in our country. This guy up here lives in Stowe, and it's 5.30 in the morning, and he's rubbing his chest and saying, I don't feel good to his wife. And he's having some substernal chest pain, and she looks at him and says, you don't look good at all. I'm calling 911. And in Stowe, I got fire, police, and EMS in that guy's living room in eight minutes, right? And they look at him, and they're like, you look like you're having a heart attack. And they give him a sublingual nitroglycerin, they make him chew an aspirin and a beta blocker, they put in a big bore IV, and they transmit his EKG in his living room to this little ER that UMass runs in Clinton, and they're like, whoa, 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 don't bring him here. Mm -mm, bypass us, get him, get him straight to the big hospital, let's send him to Worcester. Um, and UMass warms up its cath lab, the cath lab gets bypassed. This guy ends up with quadruple bypass surgery. He's on the telemetry floor, he's on the med surge floor, he's in the ICU for a while. He ends up with 12 weeks of cardiac rehab. He has a whole lot of things done to him, okay? How much money did we just spend on him? A lot was the answer, right? About a quarter million dollars is my guess. $250,000 for a massive interior wall in my, okay? His next door neighbor in Stowe is a 24-year-old kid. You see her in this picture. She's 24 years old, and she graduated from this high school. She was one of your rock star athletes, played soccer here. She went to BC on a soccer scholarship. In her sophomore year, she had tore her ACL, and she couldn't play soccer anymore. And she felt like her life was over. She couldn't afford to be at BC anymore. She had a couple surgeries on her knee, and she found that the only time she felt normal was when she was using the Percocet that the orthopedic surgeon gave her. And she kept going back to him for more. And after about six weeks, the orthopedic surgeon said, you know what, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm cutting you off. And she began buying pills on the street, and within a very short amount of time, she was using heroin. And for the last three years, her life has been off the rails. She's been a wreck. 
She's overdosed a couple times. She's lost so many things, including her sense of self-love and self-respect. But nine months ago, she moved back home with her mom and Stowe. She's a new therapist. She's going to meetings. She's getting some um, significant trauma treatment. She's going to a local Suboxone clinic. She's, she's doing well again. She's working at the local coffee shop. Things are better in her life. But this morning, when her mom knocked on that bathroom door and found there was no answer behind it, that mom freaked out because the mom's been around the block, right? She kicks the door in and finds her daughter lying on the bathroom floor not breathing. She calls 911 first, she starts CPR, and she administers the first drug overdose chemical called naloxone, but her daughter doesn't start breathing again. But by this time, I have stowed patrol cars in her driveway. They have four vials of Narcan. It takes five vials of Narcan before this young woman comes back to life. And they bring her to the emergency room in Clinton. And what happens to her? They shame her. That's exactly what happened to her. That's right. That was the, sadly the right answer. She was let go without treatment, yet they took the time to make her feel like a piece of trash. I want to tell you a little bit more about her next door neighbor, that 68-year-old guy with the massive interior wall MI. Both of his parents had significant cardiovascular disease. His mom died of a heart attack at the age of 70. His dad had a massive stroke at the age of 65. He smokes about a pack a day. He cut back, but he's down to a pack a day, which is good. He kicks back about a 12-pack of beer every day. And he would go to McDonald's seven days a week if his wife would let him. He only goes four days a week. Does this guy have addiction? OK, what's he addicted to? Yeah, alcohol. Nicotine and food, you guys got it. Salt, sugar, whatever the other chemicals in McDonald's food. This guy is an addict, right? Did he create his heart attack? He did. I told you he had a genetic history, but once I tell you that both of his parents smoke, genetics are irrelevant, right? Tobacco is the number one killer in our country. The second leading cause of death is lack of exercise and poor diet, and the third is alcohol. This guy partakes in the three leading causes of death, and he created his heart attack. We just spent a quarter million dollars on him, and did anybody roll into his living room and say, you know what, you're just a dirty addict. I'm not going to provide you medical care. Did anybody do that in the cardiac cath lab? Did anybody in the, in the, the neuro, I'm sorry, in the cardiac unit afterwards make him feel like a piece of trash for having created his heart attack? No, they didn't. They provided him the best quality medical care available in the world, period. Nobody asked questions about the money that was being spent. The nature of medical care in this country is that many diseases are diseases that we create. That's just a fact. Now, of course, some of us get cancer for no good reason. Some of us have type 1 diabetes for no good reasons. But many of our other diseases is because a lot of us, including myself, carry a little extra weight. We don't eat all the time the best way possible. Who's perfect in this room? Give me your hands. Who's my vegan marathon runner? Where are you? There's always one. There's somebody here. Okay. Most of us make decisions during the day that are mostly good, but sometimes we make decisions that aren't so good. I am a family doctor. I take care of chronic disease all day long. I take care of people who are obese and who smoke and drink too much and eat, don't eat well and never exercise. That's my job. And I don't sit there and shame you and make you feel like a piece of dirt. I say, what do you think we could make a change in your life? What small little change is really reasonable for you? Let's talk about it. That's it. So what bothers me in this country more than anything else, the reason I spend more time on this slide than anything else is the disparity in care provided to two human beings is appalling. We have two human beings who are suffering. We have two human beings who are on the verge of dying. And we gave one of them the best care, and we gave another one zero care. And in fact, we likely caused her harm. You know what needed to happen to that kid in the ER? You know what needed to happen to her? She needed a great nurse to walk up to her and say, I talked to your mom in the waiting room. I heard how great you have been. I heard for the last nine months you have been digging deep and getting your life back on track, and I'm really proud of you because this is a hard disease to get over. People relapse all the time. It's actually part of the disease. And the most common time to relapse again is between 6 and 12 months because you start to feel better, you start to feel normal, and you get this sense you can just dip your toe in and you're going to be fine. But with today's epidemic, this third wave epidemic we're in, fentanyl is in everything and it's killing people. Somebody needed to tell her, you've been doing great. I'm worried about how the next few months are going to go. Let's get more things going your way. I hear you have that new job, which is awesome, but I'm wondering, is it getting in the way of you going to therapy? Is it getting in the way of you going to meetings? You may not be able to handle your paycheck right now, 
right? What do we know about people with addiction that money often burns a hole in their pocket? Maybe your mom needs to handle your money. No judgment, but let's acknowledge that. Let me talk to your mom. Can I talk to your mom with you? Let's have that conversation. Not a single dime needed to be spent on her. I needed an adult who could have a nice conversation. That's all I needed for this kid. This needs to change in every emergency room in our nation, period. Okay. So let's go back to some science. These are PET scans of brains, okay? Like slices through the human brain. And that middle column brain are people with healthy brains. You see a lot of orange racing around. That's dopamine, racing around the brain. That's a lot of us in this room. And the brains that are over to the right side of the screen are people struggling with addiction. And you see there's not a lot of orange, not a lot of dopamine there. That top brain is, is cocaine. The next one down is methamphetamine. The third one down is alcohol, and the final one is heroin. I want you to stare at that alcohol brain for a second, okay? You still see dopamine, right? And I'm gonna spend time on alcohol. I'm not gonna pretend that alcohol is a benign substance. Just because it happens to be legal doesn't mean it's good for you, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't have a big impact on society, because alcohol does have a big impact. The wheels come off the alcohol use bus pretty late in the game. There are a lot of us who are functional alcoholics. We work with functional alcoholics. We grew up in houses with functional or not so functional alcoholics. And the point of me saying this is that the way it breaks the brain is a little slower. It doesn't mean it's not harmful, but it breaks it more slowly. So we're gonna spend time talking about sort of the statistics on alcohol in this country. But there's three things that set any one of us up to developing the disease of addiction. And here I'm talking to my adults, but I'm really talking to my students in this room. There's three things. The first is genetics. The second one is early exposure while your brain is developing. And the third one is a history of trauma, specifically childhood trauma. That's the area I'm gonna spend the least amount of time because of the age of my audience. I'm gonna skip through some of that part, but we're gonna focus on the other ones. Having poor mental health does not necessarily lead to addiction. Our kids, my kids in this room, are struggling with the highest levels of anxiety and depression that we have seen in generations. And it's really upsetting. As a mom, a mom of kids who are anxious and depressed at times, it is so hard to watch our teenagers. They're under so much pressure in the sense that you're never as good as whatever is on your screen is weighing on them all the time. And our kids cannot work hard enough these days, right? And as parents, it is such a painful thing to watch. I wanna say though, that having anxiety, depression, or another mood disorder does not cause addiction. But what happens is kids self-medicate for anxiety or depression. They start, they start using marijuana because it helps them sleep at night or it quiets down their anxiety. So it's not that the anxiety creates the addiction, it's that your brain is getting exposed early with um, marijuana, as an example, as a self-medication, and that's what causes the addiction. So just because your kid struggles with any mental health disorder, that should not li leave you with a sense of fear, but you need to get your kid treatment, really good therapy, tons of exercise, right? Meditation, mindfulness-based work, medicines work for kids who have anxiety and depression. So three things that lead to addiction, the first one being genetics. This is a hard one for me to talk about in a mixed crowd, but it isn't hard because the truth is, I think you tell your kids the truth about your genetic risk. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing addiction yourself. Your kids deserve to know their genetic risk on addiction, period. That you, they do because they get to control this one. It may not seem like they do because we all get the genetics we get. You don't get to change who your parents are. But the risk of addiction becomes diminishingly small if the kids do the next thing well, regardless of their genetics, okay? What we know about addiction is it starts while the brain is developing. If you can get to the age of 23 or 24 not having used an addictive substance, the rate of addiction goes down to 2%. 2% of people will become addicted to anything if they just postpone their use until their brain is fully developed. When you overlay genetics on top of it, meaning you have a strong genetic risk and you're already at 50%, but then you say, I'm at high risk, I am vulnerable because my parents told me I'm vulnerable, and you delay your, your rate of use until age 23 or 24, you bring down your risk of addiction to 5%. I have just changed a disease that runs in your family from 50% to 5%. And you know who drives that bus? Our kids drive that bus. They can choose to do this but they need the knowledge. They need to be told what their vulnerability is. So this is a conversation you need to have. I had it with my family. You should have it with yours. 
So what we know is that addiction is considered a developmental pediatric disease. If you're 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, 40% of those 15-year-olds go on to be alcoholics. If you postpone till age 21, only 7% go on to be alcoholics, which is about half the national rates. That's all it takes, is postponing use. Now, I don't look at my kids with a giant glass of wine in my hand and be like, don't ever drink, it's gonna kill you, because that message doesn't make sense. But I look at my kids, my kids at my house, my kids in my practice, and I say, you need to practice your no sentence with me now, because you're gonna be given plenty of opportunities to use marijuana, to vape jewels or e-cigarettes, e or to drink alcohol. You're gonna be given plenty of those opportunities. I need the I'm not interested, I'm protecting my brain sentence to fall out of your mouth so fast, you don't even know you said it before you said it, because you need to delay your use as long as possible. Right? What you do over the age of 25, right, with marijuana, with alcohol, as long as you're not putting other people in harm's way, that's a little bit on you. But the likelihood of developing addiction after 25 is vanishingly small. Why is this stuff not being taught more? Because this is a very simple message. So our kids are actually making the best decisions we have seen in 40 years. This generation is actually doing great with one big exception that we're gonna spend time on the big exception that everybody knows about, right? The e-cigarettes and the jeweling. But everything else our kids are doing is great. Let me just ask my kids in this room. I'm sorry I'm calling you kids, I apologize. Students, kids, you guys mad at me that I'm calling you kids? You're all, I'm 50, you're all way younger than me. You're my kids tonight, okay. So what do you guys think about cigarettes, tobacco sticks? They're gross. Yeah, that's the number one word I get. They're gross, they're disgusting, they're revolting. Our students think cigarettes are disgusting. The message about cigarettes went to these kids. The rate of cigarette smoking in high school seniors was as low as 2%. This generation in this room was eradicating paper cigarettes. They were getting rid of big tobacco. That's what these young people were doing. They didn't even know who Joe Camel is. They were gonna get rid of it all because they got the message about how bad cigarettes were, right? So as the sense of harm has gone up with cigarettes, the use has gone down. Now, before I get, we're gonna do the e-cigarettes and the vaping because that has exploded this whole story the other direction, but we're gonna go there. But the sense of harm with marijuana is very low. It's very low, the sense of harm. So what do people say about marijuana? I don't care who answers the question. What do you guys say? It helps your brain. Is that one of the things I heard? It helps your brain, it makes you feel better, helps anxiety. Okay, what else? It's natural, it's organic, it grows in the ground, it's better than the pharmaceuticals. What else? Did somebody say it's legal? It is legal over the age of 21 in Massachusetts. What else? It's medical, is that what it? One more time. Yeah, it's medically beneficial. I've had kids tell me it stops seizures, it cures cancer, it helps my emphysema. I've had kids tell me all kinds of things, right? Okay, so this is what our students say, our young people say about marijuana. You guys covered most of them. It's not addictive, it's natural, it's medicine, it's legal, it's better than alcohol. There's always a direct comparison to the other legal drug out there, alcohol. Um, and then I hear it never killed anyone, right? You can't overdose on pot. So I want to spend some time on marijuana because this is really important because what I think what you just saw in the room is, is a truth here. The chasm between what we as scientists think about marijuana and what our kids believe about marijuana, this is a giant expanse right here. And it'd be good if they were a little closer together. So this is what happens to the brain between the ages of 12 and 24. Some very significant changes take place. And then one of the most important ones, it only happens sitting here in this high school or in middle school. And that is something called synaptic refinement. There are tens of billions of electrical connections in your brain at the age of 12. It is a hot, tangled mess. And what must happen in that next 10 to 12 years is your brain has to prune it back. There are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synapses a second. You must actually prune back this brain in order to have a healthy brain. If you don't do this well, you end up with a brain that has schizophrenia, as an example. So this is an important thing that happens every single day in this high school. The second thing that happens to the human brain is myelination, or unsheathing rapid pathways, insulated pathways to make good decisions. That is happening during adolescence as well. Our kids' brains are fabulous. They are pushing the limits. These are brains that don't know any boundaries. They're trying to figure out, is there a floor? Is there a ceiling? This is normal brain that we are describing because these brains are trying to figure out what the heck do I need to get rid of and what do I need to lose or what do I need to hold on to? 
So there tends to be strong influence by peers. There tends to be less consideration for negative consequences. There tends to be poor impulse control. Um, there tends to be less than optimal planning. Emotions in adolescence are felt very strongly. I have two daughters at home, 15 and 17, holy smokes. That emotional spectrum in my house, within seven seconds, they go from, I love you, mom, you're so pretty, and then they're screaming at me seven seconds later. I haven't even said anything. I don't know what happened, but that's how it rolls in my house these days. Because this is a normal teenage brain, right? And I try to take a breath and remind myself of that. There, this is a brain that is hypersensitive to social exclusion. This is absolutely critical. There's never a time in your life where it is intolerable for you to be excluded, ever. And I want to spend some time on that subject. So when you're in second grade, you're seven years old, and you're sitting in your elementary school cafeteria eating your PB&J, you don't care if you're sitting by yourself. You're fine with it. You're doodling. You're making a hat out of the paper napkin. You don't care. And when you're 24 and you have your first job and you're sitting there, you're reading the New York Times on your phone eating your salad, and you don't care that you're alone. But when you are 14 years old and you're by yourself in the cafeteria, it feels like every single eye in the universe is on you. And you're asking yourself, what is it, right? What have I done wrong? Was it the stupid thing I said in math classes? Am I having a bad hair day? Is my bad outfit? because I didn't get that field hockey goal. What is wrong with me, right? The nature of adolescence is known as having the looking glass self. And this is what it feels like, right? I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. This defines being a teenager. And it is one of the reasons why many of us would never go back and relive high school or middle school. Because this is not easy. It doesn't feel good to be a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 17-year-old, and you're constantly defining yourself by how you're perceived by others. If I have adults in the room that look at this and think, oh, that's me, you need a therapist. I need to find you a therapist. Because this is something as an adult you have to grow out of. You just do. But it is the reason, one of the reasons, why our kids will say yes. They'll jump in when somebody says, let's go do this thing, because they don't want to be excluded. They want to be included. They are looking for their people all the time. It is the reason why influence of others is so strongly felt during adolescence. So three things happen to the brain. We talked about myelination. We talked about synaptic refinement. The other thing that happens at this stage is we lay down the final dopamine receptors in the outer part of the brain, and you and you, everybody knows about dopamine and how it, it is implicated with addiction. This is the reason why it's a developmental pediatric disease. It's when the dopamine gets laid out in the final part of the brain. What becomes active at this stage is a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid called anandamide. Anandamide's job is to help decide what gets clipped and what gets kept. And the problem with anandamide is that it is the mirror image to THC, or the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana, and your brain can't tell them apart. And what happens is that THC is like using a sledgehammer to decide what gets clipped in your brain, as opposed to using a scalpel. And when my kids' brains are losing their synapses in front of me, I really want a scalpel to be activated at that point and not a sledgehammer. What happens to the teenage brain when exposed to THC, it's really a neurotoxic drug to the developing brain. It is harming the development of our kids' brains. Again, what people do after the age of 25 in the privacy of their own home with alcohol or marijuana, as long as they're not on my roads, as long as they're not operating on my knee or babysitting my kids, I don't really care. Because the brain is fully developed and the harm that comes to those kids, those, those young adult brains is much less harmful than what happens to a 15 or 17 year old. So what do we know about marijuana? Is that it has an impact on attention, verbal learning, processing speed, and that stays even when you're not high. This is one of the best studies on the subject that followed people for 30 years, and it compared two categories of people. People who used marijuana zero times between the ages of 14 and 21, and I'm going to compare them to people who used marijuana 400 times or more between the ages of 14 and 21. One is the gray bar, the other one is the red bar. So graduating from college by age 25, for the category of people who used marijuana zero times during their teenage years, they graduated from college by age 25 36% of the time. For the kids who used marijuana 400 times or more, which is just using it once or twice a week, it's not even heavy daily use, only 2% graduated from college by age 25. When you look at unemployment rates, unemployment rates for kids who used zero times were 21% by age 25. Kids who used marijuana 400 times or more, 52% of them were unemployed by age 25. 
That for me is not my kids not launching, not leaving my house. I like my kids, I want them gone. I want them to grow up, I want them to get a job, walk their own dog, and pay taxes. But I don't want them living at my house. That's how I feel. So um, this is a harmful drug to the developing brain, and nobody in this room can really convince me out of that one. So the problem is that every study we have on marijuana is based on the old pot, right? Pot that was THC 3% or less, because that is all we had until about 1995. Since that time, the THC, or the psychoactive get you high part of pot, has been steadily climbing. And there's not a field-grown marijuana plant in this country that's less than 9% now. Most of it is between 9 and 20% THC. That is the stuff grown in people's yards, right? Super potent. And then you get this, which are the concentrates, right? Shatter, butter, earwax, hash oil. This is between 50 and 90% THC. So I have a drug that's causing harm, that's doing you know, psychoactive harm to kids at 3%, and I move it to an 80% THC product. You think I'm building a healthier brain? You think I'm getting kids who are smarter, better, able to actualize the full lives? I don't think so. This is harmful. And the fact that we legalize this in Massachusetts with no knowledge about its impact long term on our kids' brains is really worrisome. Can I ask you guys, you know a lot about addiction already, right here, today. You know stuff coming in. If your job was to sell an addictive drug, who's your audience? Who are you going after? Yeah, they're not going after you. They're not going after me, right? We're too old. We're never going to get addicted. They're after you guys. They're after every kid in the back. That's their market. This is not a benign industry. This is an industry bent on making billions of dollars, and their target audience is your kid, right? It's pretty unacceptable. So how do they do it? Well. They wrap the pot in a thousand different ways. You can drink it in milk and in beer. You can rub it on your skin. You can put it as a tincture under your tongue. And they wrap it in chocolate and sugar. So these are products that come from Colorado. They look just like all the candy we all grew up with. Every one of those candy bars has 12 servings of marijuana, and it's all about 80% THC. Can you guys imagine taking a Kit Kat, breaking it into 12 pieces, and then in ingesting one of them and putting the other 11 pieces away? Of course, that's crazy. Nobody would do that. So instead, people hit themselves with 12 servings of THC at 80%, and then where they are, they're psychotic and in our emergency rooms because it makes them really, really sick. And this is sort of where we're headed. If you haven't seen it, I've seen it. It's pretty unpleasant. It's hard to manage. So this comes up all the time. Kids say to me, but marijuana is not addictive. In the old days, back in the 80s and the 70s and the early 90s, when THC levels was about 3%, the addiction rate was, with marijuana was pretty low. It was 9% in the old days. We're out of those days now. So addiction to marijuana when you start as a teenager was about 17%. But when you use today's pot, addiction rate is between 30 to 50% which makes it a more addictive substance than nicotine. Nicotine used to be our most addictive substance, but it isn't anymore, right? It's now marijuana. Who is the marijuana industry anyway, right? There's a lot of people making money, but a lot of it is the former tobacco industry. That's who it is, right? And they need a next new target audience, and this is who they're going to go after, our kids. So two years ago was the first year that marijuana outpaced cigarettes. And um, you know, you're going to watch what this does in the next 10 or 20 years. And I think Massachusetts, which really should lead the nation in terms of public health, will regret some of our wide-ranging, um, poorly managed decisions about marijuana. If, I, if, if people in this room were, were in charge of the marijuana stores, what should the age be of purchase? Yeah, 25. 25, that's the answer. 25 should be the age of first purchase. And I, I would put a limit on the THC. That's what I would do. If I were the goddess of marijuana, I'd be like 25. And the limit of THC, I don't know, name a number. 20% or less, that's what I say. I think that's plenty high. Good, done, right? But it wouldn't be this. And other states have done that. Other states have a limit, not us. We said do it all. OK, let's talk about alcohol. One third of us in this country drink nothing ever. Does, we don't drink. Another third of us drink very lightly, a drink a week, a drink a month, very light social drinkers. The final one third of us drink every drop of alcohol in the country. One third of us drink it all. In fact, the final 10% of us drink on average 10 drinks a day. That's a lot of alcohol. 10% of Americans drink 10 drinks a day. 
So how does that happen? Well, it doesn't take much to get to 10 drinks. A cocktail, who is a bartender in this room? Anybody a bartender? Okay. So I was not a bartender, but I, 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 uh, I asked many bartenders. The average mixed drink often has two or three drinks in it, right? Because it's only 1.5 ounces of hard alcohol counts as one drink. So you're mixing a drink, you're actually drinking two drinks. Sometimes a strong cocktail has three drinks in it. So you need to keep track of how you're drinking. Uh, this is our real problem these days, is the way that women are drinking. So I take care of people all day. I say, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And women say to me, oh, you know, I have a couple of drinks tonight. I'm like, what are you drinking? I drink wine. Well, what are you pouring? You know, a normal wine glass. And they show me something like this, right? And I think, oh, that's not normal. So this is what a glass of wine is. It's five ounces. That's a glass of wine. And all I ask of anybody is to pay attention what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because when you're an adult walking home after a miserable day at work, and you say to your kids, I've had a terrible day at work, and the first thing your kid sees is you uncorking a bottle of wine or flipping the top of a, of a beer can, the message you send to your kid is when you're stressed out, when you're overwhelmed, you don't know what else to do, you drink, and that fixes the problem. That's not the message you want to send to your kid. When you walk home after a terrible day at work and you look at your kid and say, I've had a bad day, you should say, I'm going to go for a walk. Anybody want to come with me? I'm going to go sit down on my yoga mat. I'm going to do a 10-minute mindfulness exercise on my phone. That's what I'm going to do because it will help quiet down my, my fight-or-flight nervous system right now. But turning to alcohol for self-medication, that's what a lot of us do as adults. And we have to be conscious of what we're doing. There is no health benefit to alcohol. That is a giant lie brought to you by the alcohol industry. That is who funds those studies, right? The health benefit is very modest or zero. Cancer is caused by alcohol consumption. I need my adults in the room to be conscious of this, right? You're all trying to be great role models for your kids. I have my alcohol locked up in my house. It's under lock and key. That may seem like I'm a crazy parent. I'm actually not a crazy parent. But I was in high school in the 1980s, and I know how we got our alcohol. We stole it from our parents. And I don't want to be that house. I don't want to be the house where the kids are getting alcohol from. I'm sorry, not me. So it's under lock and key at my house. And I think it should be under your house, too. If it's in your house, make sure it's safe from your kids. OK, people say this to me. Well, I want to train my kid. I want to train them before they go to high school so they know how to drink well. And I think to myself, oh, no, that is such not a good idea. And they've actually done studies. What does it look like when parents provide alcohol to their kids? Well, lo and behold, their kids have higher rates of alcohol use disorder, and they tend to be binge drinkers. You're not helping your kid by training them. And I want to be clear, you are not helping anybody when you host an alcohol party at your house. It's illegal to provide alcohol to minors. Um, it is illegal. And you're not helping anybody. Your rule with your kid is, I will come rescue you day or night, in any circumstance. You call me, I won't yell at you in the middle of the night. I may yell at you the next day, because I may have to, but I will rescue you at any point from any circumstance, but do not ever put yourself on the road when you're under the influence, right? Have a special code language for you getting your kid evacuated from any circumstance on their phone. You need to know where your kid is, and a code word that says you need to come get me now. Without judgment, that night you get your kid. The next day you have a pretty serious conversation. So people say to me, but they drink in Europe all the time, and everybody's good in Europe, right? They start drinking at 12. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Let's look at the World Health Organization numbers on where our biggest drinking countries are. Oh, the first 25 countries in the world are in Europe. Top heaviest countries in the world, only two of the top 25 are not European countries. Europe is not doing better than we are in terms of alcohol use disorder. They're just not. The rates of drinking in the country of Ireland when you're pregnant. 60% of pregnant women in Ireland are drinking. Fetal alcohol syndrome in Ireland is 400 times the rate it is in this country. They are not doing better than we are, right? The United States isn't even in the top 25. OK, I'm going to slide through these slides fast. There's three things that cause addiction. I did two of them. The third one is growing up in a household that was scary, that was neglectful, where you were harmed. Because when you grow up with strong childhood trauma, it stays with you for the rest of your life. And one of the ways that we escape trauma and feelings of trauma as adults is we try to run from it. We drink, we drug. It's a very high association between growing up in a chaotic household and struggling with addiction later. I'm intentionally going to avoid this because it's a complicated conversation to have. There's a great study called the ACE study. If you go to my website, I have tons of articles on this thing. If you're in the healthcare field, if you're a teacher, if you're a therapist, you should know this stuff inside and out. Because what adverse childhood experiences does to the human body long term is very significant. 
Um, three things, genetics or trauma or early use, you do not need all three, you kind of just need one. And the message adults need to give to their kids is, I need to talk to you about substance use disorder, I need to start it pretty early. What's the average age of first use of nicotine, alcohol, or marijuana? Does anybody know the average age of first use? Older than nine, although that's great, it's 12, right? The average age is 12, 13, or 14, so that is a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader, first use. So if your first conversation with your kid is when they're in 10th grade, whoa, 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 that horse left the barn, right? So really, fifth grade, you know what? Five-year-old, five-year-old drug talk goes like this. You see a pill on the ground, you go get an adult. You get an adult, any pill, anything that even looks like a pill. You think it looks like candy, you get an adult. Because an ACE inhibitor, uh, a, a normal high blood pressure medicine will kill a five-year-old, okay? Nobody knows that, but it's a fact. So that's a drug talk for a five-year-old, right? You just sort of make it age appropriate. But really, in fifth grade is when we need to be talking to our kids about avoiding substances that are addictive. So our kids, again, I want every kid in this room to do this little thing where you reach back and you pat yourselves on the back, because this young generation is making fabulous decisions about alcohol, about most substances. There's a giant exception to this that everybody in the room knows about, and that is that our kids are using e-cigarettes, vaped products, and jewels more than is it is unimaginable how this has exploded. This hit us out of nowhere. Something happened in the summer of 2017 that some smart kid in the back, if you guys want a great honors science project, you need to do the internet forensics on what happened in the summer of 2017, because 12 things went viral. And when September of 2017 started, the vapes, the jewels, they were everywhere. Before that, there was some of it, but nothing like we see now. It's not just Neshoba High School, it's every high school in the country. This has become, sadly, normal behavior. Right now, 25% of high school seniors are vaping, 25%. Last year, it was 11%. And in 2011, it was 2%. This thing came out of nowhere, and it is our kids are addicted to nicotine. Where did that happen? I already gave my kids in this room credit for eradicating cigarettes, because that's what they've done, but they have been getting backdoored by the tobacco industry. That is what's happening now. So this is what it looks like. So we did a study a year ago that surveyed every zero milligram e-juice that's sold from the United States. So most kids, if you ask the kids what's in the e-juices, what's in it? chemicals, and there's not 500 chemicals, at least not listed on the bottle. The truth is these are not investigated by the FDA, so we don't really know what's in there, but there's water, there's flavor, and then there's chemicals. There's formaldehyde, there's preservatives, but the zero milligram nicotine, you would think there wasn't nicotine in them, right? So they surveyed 70 zero milligram nicotine e-juices. What percent of them had nicotine in them? Yeah, just about all of them. 90% had nicotine in them. Some of them had the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. They are all labeled zero milligrams of nicotine, but what did they do? They lied to you, that's what they did. Because you know what they want you to do? They want you to get addicted to nicotine, right? You can call me a conspiracy theorist, I'm actually not, this is just reality. Who funds this? The tobacco industry. This is unregulated. Where do you buy this stuff? Convenience stores, where else? Gas stations, okay, right. Do you think that going into a gas station, they're really carting these kids? How old do you have to be to buy this in, in Massachusetts? No, 21. As of January 1st, the state law changed. You have to be 21 or older. So my 18s who have been buying, that's pretty worrisome because that shouldn't be happening. But don't you guys think that we should do a stakeout in these three towns? We should have our school resource officer sitting outside and I should send you in to buy something and see how it goes, right? And if they sell to you, then that gas station, that convenience store is publicly shamed on the front page of the paper for selling to an underage kid. That's what I would do, because I find it outrageous. I know they're selling it. But where do our kids really get this stuff? The internet, and how old do you need to be on the internet? Yeah, you need to be 18, but what does it take to be 18 on the internet? Yeah, you check a button, I'm 18, that's all it takes to buy this on the internet. So this is what the, the, the e-juices look like. They come in like vanilla wafer flavor, in ready whipped cream, and they look just like apple juice boxes. These are intended for our children. Go home tonight and look up the flavors that you can get in an e-cigarette. These are not intended to get long distance truck drivers across the country and have them stop smoking. These are intended, these are targeting our kids. 
And the first thing we would all do, all of us who are goddesses now of the e-vaporizing cigarette, we would ban every flavored juice there is. Just ban it. You don't need a flavor. There's no flavor needed. If you need to get off cigarettes, I have lots of tools to help you do that. But I would ban every flavor out there. The first thing, just do it. The federal government has that within their capacity. The FDA considered doing it two weeks ago, and they got too much pressure from the lobby. So they backed off. So everybody knows about jewels. The jewels don't lie. The jewels don't say we're nicotine free. The jewel says we're actually filled with nicotine. And every jewel pod is the equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. And these are cool, right? They feel cool. They're high tech. They're magnetic, so you can scoot them off your laptop where it's been charging, and it will automatically magnetize to the bottom of your desk. It's sitting in a toilet paper roll in the hallway bathroom right now because this thing is smart. They're actually weirdly more addictive than cigarettes because when you smoke a cigarette, the first one third of the cigarette has most of the nicotine, and the final two thirds doesn't have a lot. This has an equal amount of nicotine through the whole thing. So these are some of the most addictive products we've ever seen. I have kids who cannot get through their high school day, right? They're in the parking lot vaping because they're in nicotine withdrawal all day long. Their kids in this high school are in nicotine withdrawal, period. And you know what? These aren't the bad kids doing this. These aren't the kids on the wrong side of the town. We find tons of athletes who are vaping, tons. This has become widespread everywhere. And my hope is when you saw the display out there, you were able to identify things that you may not have recognized as being any one of these products. So um, can I spend a minute on ADD? OK, so ADD is a disease state uh, that is diagnosed in this country. It's been increasing in diagnosis patterns. Everybody knows ADD, ADD and ADHD. I'm going to just use one of them. I'm not going to differentiate them, although they are distinct. But the rates of diagnosis have increased. So the average rates of ADD in the world or in this country is between 6 and 9%. OK, so some communities have much higher diagnosis. It doesn't, I think it's overdiagnosed, quite honestly, in many communities. The rates have increased. You can see that the rates of the uh, diagnosis really depends on what state you live in. These are the purple states or states where ADHD is diagnosed more often. What we know about kids who really have a diagnosis of ADHD is they tend to be more risky in their behaviors. They tend to be more likely to try substances, specifically nicotine. Nicotine is known as the substance with ADD that they're most likely to jump to because it seems to help focus a little bit. So kids with ADD are at higher risk of developing a substance use disorder because they tend to self-medicate. And I'm saying that just for people in the room, parents and kids, just to acknowledge that this is a slightly higher risk thing. The question that I always get, though, is does the medicine we use to treat ADD, does that cause addiction? And they've done studies on these things, and it says there's no connection between using good medicine that has been decided we're at the stage where this is necessary. Using medicine, stimulants, or other medicine to treat ADD does not cause addiction. And in fact, in one meta-analysis, it said using the stimulants actually was protective against addiction because you want your kids not to be self-medicating. Right? And having ADHD that's uncontrolled in the classroom really is really challenging. Not just for the kid, although it is really challenging for the kid. It's challenging for the teachers, for the classmates. And you're not a popular um, sixth grader when you're ticking everybody off and you're accidentally overshooting everybody and everybody lost their recess because you couldn't, you couldn't zip your lips, right? It doesn't feel good to have untreated ADHD. And so my point is, is I, I need us to acknowledge there is an interplay between these two things. People ask me this one all the time. It's the reason I want to mention it to you guys. So let's talk about opiates. I know you guys are getting tired. You've been great. But I want to talk about the drug right now that's killing people more than anything else. The number one killer under the age of 50 is death by opiates. And there's no doubt that pills are on the hook for this. The overprescribing of opiates in the last 25 years created this epidemic. We started it. Doctors like me started this epidemic. And the question is, are we up for the task of fixing it? So when you look at the US compared to every other country in the world, we prescribe more opiates than everybody, right? More opiates than Canada. We're not different than Canadians. Canadians has the same level of disease that we all have. But we prescribe more opiates for it. And at this point, death by opiates has surpassed motor vehicle accidents, HIV at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, Death by gun violence. This is, again, the number one killer under the age of 50. So when you look at the map of the US, and it starts in 2003 and it ends in 2014, those red areas are where overdoses are happening. And you see the red spread as the years go by. 2016 is where fentanyl comes to Massachusetts and New Hampshire and New England. And at this point, 
Much of the Northeast is a deep maroon because so many people are dying. The route for pills coming to Massachusetts and New England was up I-95. We used to call it Oxy Highway. It came to us from you know, 650 pill mills in Florida. There would be tour buses that would go to Florida. You had your whole way paid, your meals, your hotel, your bus fare, and your job was to walk into two mill pill mills a day. You had a chunk of cash, you handed it to them, you didn't need a diagnosis, you didn't need to limp, you needed nothing. And you walked out with a bag of pills and a stack of prescriptions that then you handed back to your tour operator, and then they went back to Western Massachusetts and Maine and Kentucky, and they sold it all. And in 2009 and 2010, the federal government looked at Florida and said, if you cannot control this, we will cut off all federal funding. No highway funds, no education funds, because your state is destroying the eastern seaboard. And so in 2010, the federal government went in and closed them down. They shut down, swept in the pill mills. They sent 34 doctors to federal prison because they weren't doctors. They were doctors, but they were drug dealers. And the problem is now I have 2 million Americans who are addicted to opiates up and down I-95, and I just shut down my pipeline. So what am I left with? Yeah, I'm left with people with addiction for sure, but I'm left with people with addiction who don't have their drug, yet there's a very available, cheap drug out there. It's called heroin. It had been widespread distributed throughout the nation at this point. This is truly a deadly drug. You can drive a pill overdose, but this is really going to kill you. We were not ready. We were in no way prepared in public health for the shutdown of Florida to be left with this. We did not have treatment. We did not have people doing addiction services. We did not know what we were doing, and that's what we've been dealing with for the last nine years. And it's been really painful for those of us who have lost family members and loved ones. I can't tell you how many of my patients have died, but it's a big number. So this is what the country looked like. That bottom map is prior to Florida getting shut down. Those red states are overdose, high rates of overdose. That top part is what happens after Florida gets shut down. I wanted Florida shut down. I was thrilled that it happened, but we weren't ready for the, the second wave, which was heroin and now fentanyl. So 2016 is when synthetic opiates, which is what fentanyl is called, that's when that kicks in. And look at that spike in death. And this is the amount of fentanyl it takes to kill you. That is a penny. That is little dusty pieces of fentanyl. That's the amount it takes to kill you. And that is everywhere. It's cheaper than heroin. It's manufactured in China, sometimes in Mexico, and it comes to us via FedEx and UPS and you know, a delivery truck. That's how it gets here. And it's everywhere. It's in cocaine. We sometimes find it in marijuana. This is a very deadly drug, and we don't have any control over it anymore. So when you look at the nation, these counties, this is a county map of the nation. Those counties are counties where there's high levels of opiates still prescribed in a bottle from your doctor. The rates of prescribing nationwide have really, really gone down. They're not low enough, but they have really gone down. How do our kids get exposed to opiates? Well, thank goodness our kids in general are not using opiates, because the place they used to get the opiates from was from us. They would go through their parents' or grandparents' aunt, uncle's medicine cabinet. The truth is, today, in 2019, we've cleaned out our cabinets. Everybody in this room, if you have an old bottle of oxycodone, of hydrocodone, of Ativan, if you have old bottles of stuff sitting around your house, well, you gotta get rid of it, because shame on you, that belongs in a police take-back box, and every town here has a police take-back box, right? You can get rid of this stuff practically anywhere. The kids should not be getting it from you. They get it from a prescription, right? They are prescribed it because they break their femur playing ice hockey, because they get their wisdom teeth out. And what you need to do as an adult is you need to look at the prescriber and say, how am I gonna help my kids' pain? without exposing them to opiate. Talk me through it. How do I manage it, please? And most prescribers in this day and age will take a breath and they'll tell you what to do. They'll say plan A is this and then plan B is this. And plan C is we're going to use the lowest amount of the least potent opiate possible to help your kid, right? If your kid has cancer and they have cancer metastases to their bone, you're going to use opiates without any question. I'm talking about normal injuries of childhood that don't really require that. Because I want every young person in this room to scoot through adolescence without developing an opiate use disorder. So if you love somebody who struggles, you need to have Narcan on you. I carry it in my car, I carry it in my purse. The school nurse has Narcan. I'm saying that with some confidence. Lisa, is that true, the school nurse has Narcan? Right. You know who made that? The school nurses. One day the school nurses got together and said, we should have Narcan in the schools. We have, uh, I don't know, 400 EpiPens. But I don't know who might have an opiate use disorder at school. It could be a teacher, it could be a kid, it could be a parent, it could be the janitor. We should have one Narcan vial. And the school nurses just said, let's do it, right? I didn't ask anybody in my school. I didn't go to the school committee. We just got Narcan. And that's because school nurses get things done. So it's a great thing that this school district does that. <laughs> People
people get better with addiction, it doesn't happen always on the timeline I want, right? It doesn't happen on the timeline that their parents want. It takes a lot of things to get better. It's not one way through. It's not going to 90 meetings in 90 days, although that does help many people. It takes a lot of things going your way to get better. One of the biggest deficits we have in this state and in this country is living, places to go, long-term sober living if you're struggling with addiction, because you can't go back home and live with the same people you were using with. You're not gonna make it. You cannot stay sober in that circumstance. And one of the things that people battle against is I don't want a sober house in my town. You know what? You need a sober house in your town. You probably need three of them. And when somebody comes in and says, I wanna build a sober house that can hold four people, please support it. Don't say no to it, because you know who those kids are? They're your kids. They're your nieces and nephews. They're your graduates from this school. They used to be the stars of the football team. Let them come to a safe, loving environment where they can be well and be sober. We have got to build more sober housing. I believe in medicine for treatment, any medicine, whatever is effective. I use methadone, I use buprenorphine, also called Suboxone, I use naltrexone. There's three evidence-based drugs for treatment. I believe all of them should be available to anybody who needs that treatment, including in our houses of corrections. I'm a doctor at a jail. It is appalling to me that we violate the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution by not providing treatment for people. And I represent a jail that is likely to be one of the first methadone treatment jails in the entire country in little rural western Massachusetts because we should be leading the way on this effort. So people do get better. I want you to believe that, but it isn't easy. And it's much more important for us to prevent this disease than treat it later. If that's the one message you guys hear from me, delay your use as long as possible. If you thought this talk was interesting, if you want to hear more, if you want to learn more, any one of these books are great on the subject of addiction. Um, this is a good time if you're not going to get the slide deck to take out your smartphone and think, I think I need to learn more. I work in this field. I want to learn more. Any one of these books is great. There is a book up here for high school students. It's the book called Hey Kiddo. It's a graphic novel about a young guy born and raised in Worcester whose mom was a heroin addict and he was raised by his grandparents. It's salty is what I will say. It's full of curse words, um, but high school kids, you got this. It's a fine book. It's intended for high school kids. Um, did anybody see the movie Beautiful Boy? Yeah, you saw the movie. Wow, how was it? It was really good, yeah. It's a sad, heartbreaking story, and the book is as heartbreaking. It, it's just it's so upsetting. But these are great books on addiction. I have a website. It's just my name. I have video. I have a talk I give to a bunch of middle school kids. I have tons of articles. Any article I read where I think, oh, that was a great article, that changed something in my brain, I post it on the website. So you're welcome to go there. If you saw this and thought, you know what, my sister should hear this talk, but she lives in Idaho, the talks are on the website. I change them all the time. I'm constantly updating them. But there's some version of this talk on the website. Too.